Good morning. The sound system is not on. Sound system not on. Okay. Well, I'll start anyway. Even though you can't hear me, good morning. Welcome to the First Presbyterian Church of Sussex. And now you can hear me. And uh, we have a beautiful day in front of us. And we have a beautiful service in front of us. I'd like to start by reading the personal meditation. All life on this planet requires water to survive. Water is life. Water is an integral part of both gardening and sacrament. The psalmist calls, cries out to God, desiring to seek God as a thirsty long for a drink of water. Jesus says to the Samaritan woman about living water, she can drink without ever having to be thirsty again. <laughs> There's water. Somebody's not muted. <laughs> Please join me in our call to worship. We gather in this Lenten season knowing we are broken. We gather in this Lenten season knowing we need forgiveness. We gather in this Lenten season knowing our hearts long for God. We gather in this Lenten season knowing God calls us all. Come, let us of God, our loving, merciful, and gracious Lord. Please stand, if you're able, or stand in spirit to join us all in our hymn number 81, Lord, who through these 40 days. Thank you. 
You may be seated. Well, stand up again. Now be seated again. When I was in high school, uh, candidate, there was a debate candidate to lead the student body. And at one point, the guy who's really a big joker, it wasn't me, this was the year ahead of me, gets up and says, all right, everybody stand up. Everybody stood up. All right, sit down. Now you see, I can be a leader. <laughs> Our God is merciful and loving. No matter what you've done or not done, God's love for you never changes. We come together in this time of confession as a way to help us to grow into more Christ-like disciples. Trusting in God's grace and love, let us confess our sin first in unison and then in the silence of our hearts. Please join me in our unison prayer of confession. God, we confess that we have often rejected the call of your baptism. Too often we have accepted the forces of wickedness and embraced the evil powers of this world. We have forgotten the covenant made against evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves. We have forgotten the promises of baptism. We long for you as the thirsty long for water. We recognize our souls and need you to cry out, just as our bodies need water for survival. We have the strength to name our weakness. May we be forgiven. May we turn toward you. May we remember and reclaim our promise to the Holy Spirit in the blessing of baptismal waters. Help us to choose the path that leads to love. We journey closer to Easter morning. We rejoice in the gift Christ gave us in his life, ministry, death, and resurrection. Through this gift, we find new life, new clarity, a new beginning. Know that in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, having heard and made known so deeply and so truly that we are so loved by God and through Christ we can find peace, let us share a sign of Christ's peace with one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. I would love to invite the children forward, please. And instead of sitting down today, we're going to stand around this. Good morning, ladies. Good morning, gentlemen. So, last week, in our special time together, we talked about life. Does anybody remember that? We talked about life and the things we need to live. And one of those things is water, right? We all need water to live. We have to drink water. Our bodies are mostly water, right? We need water. And as humans, we of course need water to survive, right? Everyone agrees we need water to survive. And today, the theme for our worship service is water. And in when I think about water in the church, what's one big thing? Baptism. Baptism. Exactly. This book. Baptism. And this is our baptismal font. This is where the water goes. So baptism is how we as Christians affirm our belief in Christ's presence in our lives. And this baptismal font holds the water that we use to baptize the people who want this symbol, this blessing in their lives. We mostly baptize babies, right? But people of any age can be baptized. I'm guessing, I think all of you were baptized as babies, so you won't remember it. But every time we do a baptism, we always remember our baptism. So I thought today we could all touch the water. 
Can we touch the water? I put water in there and everything. Normally for baptisms, though, I make it warmer. It's a little cold, right? As a baby, you don't want all that cold water on your head. But this is the baptismal font. We put some water in there. Yeah. Thank you. You want to drink it? No, maybe we can do some water from the fellowship hall. That's a little, a little safer to drink it. We haven't all had our fingers in that water. So we mainly baptize babies, and but we also will baptize a teen or an adult, whoever would like to be baptized, when they're ready to embrace this symbol of how much God loves us. And that's what this is. The baptism of God tells us that God loves us so much. So when we get baptized as babies, we're not making the choice, right? Our parents make the choice for us to baptize us. And so what we do as we're growing up is we decide we want to follow Jesus. And so how, how can you, as today, right now, 2023, how can you choose to follow Jesus? Pray. Pray. That's a great one. Church. Go to church. Mm -hmm. What are some other things we can do to follow Jesus? We've had two really good answers. There's lots. They can be anything. What about, oh, did we? What about serving other people? Is that a way to, to follow Jesus? Yeah. What about reading our Bible? Mm -hmm. That's another good one. Those are some good examples. Love. love, love one another, definitely. So those are all some great ideas. So now we can think about these as we head away, remembering our baptisms, that we need water to live. Our baptism helps give us spiritual life. So with that, let's pray. Y'all want to pray with me? Here we go. Dear God, Dear God thank, you thank you for water, for water and, for and for baptism. Thank you for giving us life and for loving us so much. Help us to follow Jesus throughout our whole lives. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Good job, Owen. You knew the end of that prayer. Okay, so everybody, you can go head out to be with Miss Kathy. You can go be with your, your parents. And now I'd love to invite the choir forward. Thank you. 
Let us turn now in our Bibles to Psalm 63, verses 1 through 8, which will be found on pages, page 458 of our, what did I do? Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> speeding right along here. First of all, let's do the prayer for illumination. I remember years ago, Charlie, uh, Reverend Jenkins, up here doing communion, and he forgot to do the bread and just went right on to the wine. And of course, everybody reacted. He said, oh, oh yeah, the bread. Let's do the bread too. <laughs> I don't know how many of you besides me miss Reverend Jenkins, but I miss him all the time. Uh, so let me see, what am I doing now? I'm doing it for a prayer for illumination, which it goes, God of everlasting water, quench our thirst in the reading of your word today. Show us your continual care for this world and for us, your people. May we hear your scriptures read with fresh ears and hearts. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And then, of course, we go to page 458 for the Psalm 63, verses 1 through 8. O oh God, you are my God. I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, for your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you, so I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands and call on your name. My soul is satisfied as with a rich feast, and my mouth praises you with joyful lips. When I think of you on my bed and meditate you in the watches of the night, for you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I sing for joy. My soul clings to you, your right hand upholds me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Before we get to our second gospel, re our second reading, which is Gospel of John, I just wanted to say one quick note. Congrats, everybody, for getting here on time. <laughs> we remembered our clocks, or at least the ones that wake us up. So good job, everybody. And uh, with that in mind, we can now turn to the Gospel of John, chapter four. And I'll be reading verses between verses five through 42. It's a long passage, so there are some selected ones. You can see what they are. Um, but this is a 
a really beautiful interaction between Jesus and the woman at the well. So with this in mind, let us listen now to this this beautiful narrative story uh, in a very important conversation with Jesus and this woman. If you'd like to follow along, it's on page 864 of our Pew Bibles. So Jesus and his disciples came to a Samaritan city called Sakar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God, and who it is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you, you have no bucket and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Just then, his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman. But no one said, what do you want or why are you speaking to her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And Jesus stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you have said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves. And we know that this is truly the Savior of the world, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. God, it is in your abundant love for this world that we meet today, that we have this time to come together and listen to your scriptures and think about them together. May we, through all that we do, share the life-giving water that comes from Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So far in our sermon series this Lent, we've looked at the importance of soil, of order, and of life in the garden and in our spiritual lives. And this week, we're looking at water. And hands down, water is one of the most essential things in our world. Everything on this planet that is living relies on water. Even people who say, I don't like water, still need water to survive. And they just get it from other liquids and foods. And as we know, plants need water to grow too. If it's a dry summer, then gardeners and farmers have to water their plants more than if it's a rainy one. Reverend Kara Eveson writes, the life of the gardener necessitates a constant watch on the weather, especially rain. I need to know if it rained last night while I was sleeping, and if so, how much? 
I keep an eye on the forecast, the sky, and the moisture of the soil of the garden beds. When my peace lily plant is thirsty, it begins to droop. Within an hour or so of watering it, it perks right back up. Unfortunately, most of the food we grow doesn't communicate as clearly as my peace lily. Tomato plants do not convey their feelings so readily. I must be far more vigilant in modern, monitoring their conditions. Modern city and suburban culture has detached us from weather in some fascinating ways. I once heard of a young lady from the big city who stopped at a gas station in a rural area. It was pouring down rain that day and she was very unhappy about traveling in the rain. She voiced her frustration loudly near the coffee booths where several locals were sitting. They all sat and shook their heads as she complained. They didn't share her frustration at all. Rather, the farm community had been rejoicing all day because the rain marked the end of a long and painful drought. For farmers, what happens with the weather is a matter of their professional well-being. However, for most suburban and city dwellers, the connection between nature and our food sources is almost completely invisible, so much so that things like rain are mere traveling barriers or good for the lawn. We all know that we need water. And yet, I know there have been times when I've been sad about rain in the forecast because it's inconvenient for my plants. And that's because I take it for granted that I'll have more than enough water for my needs. So growing up in California means I do know the value of rain since the area where I grew up is basically always in some kind of drought condition, or at least very close to it. The more arid and dry a place is, the more important water truly becomes. And Israel, both in Jesus' day and today, is an arid place. It has desert conditions, especially when it comes to fresh drinking water. Wells and naturally occurring springs were an incredibly important part of ancient life because the well was the way people had water to drink, to cook with, to keep their animals alive. There wasn't any plumbing to rely on. And so cities and towns would pop up around pre-existing wells, less work for the newcomers in the area. Our passage from John tells us the location for this passage is Jacob's well, and the city that was built close by, Sakar. Wells were generally places where women would go to each day in the early morning to get the hard job of lugging water back to their homes done before the heat of the day sets in. Plus, it gave them a chance to socialize and help one another with the task of getting enough water to last their family throughout the day. And so this woman coming around noon is a surprise and would have tipped off the first listeners and readers and hearers that, uh, that this interaction, something strange was going on in this woman's life because she is going to the well at a time when it is very likely deserted. But when she gets there, it's not deserted. Instead, Jesus is there presumably waiting for his disciples to come back with some food. His waiting by the well, however, leads to a fascinating and important conversation with this Samaritan woman. Two things of note that would have also shocked the original listeners into paying closer attention to this conversation is that this person isn't just anyone. She's a Samaritan woman. And these two identifiers make a world of difference to the audience and say a Jewish man. During Jesus' time, it was very unusual for men and women who weren't related or married to interact, especially not alone. So this chance meeting at the well would have already been pushing societal values. The second 
is actually the Samaritan. Reverend Eason explains the background between Samaritans and Jewish people like this. She says, Samaritans branched off from Jews during the time when the Israelites were divided into northern and southern kingdoms. The southern kingdom of Judah contained Jerusalem, the only place the descendants of Abraham and Sarah could rightly worship Yahweh. So the kings and leaders of the northern kingdom, Israel, established new places to worship so that their people would have no reason to enter the southern kingdom. The northern people who believed a person could worship Yahweh somewhere other than Jerusalem became known as Samaritans. And despite the political and theological split being 700-ish years old by Jesus' time, the Jewish people, the people that were from southern kingdom, still thought so little of the apostate Samaritans that they avoided even speaking to them. So when Jesus, a good Jewish man, asks a Samaritan woman for a drink of water, it is shocking and disturbing for those who later hear the story. Throughout his life and teaching, Jesus repeatedly disregards social norms and stereotypes. He is not offering the woman at the well a cup of water, but the refreshment of everlasting life. So what we learn from this, right, is that this whole interaction would have been taboo. And we can see this later in the passage when in verse 27, John tells us that when Jesus' disciples came, that they were astonished that Jesus was speaking with a woman. Right? This just wasn't done. It wasn't part of the social fabric. But for Jesus, he really doesn't care about the social fabric. He cares about people and what the people are going through. He cares about this woman who is very likely ostracized from her community, likely because she had five previous husbands and now she's living with a man she's not married to. That was one of the verses I skipped just for time. And it's in their conversation that we can see the difference between physical thirst and spiritual thirst. When Jesus tells the woman that he has a spring of water gushing up to eternal life, the woman doesn't realize that he means this metaphorically, spiritually. Instead, she's hoping for a way to never physically need water again, which isn't possible for humans, for any life at all. She's so caught up in the pressure of life and of her community and she'd love a reason to not have to come back to the well, to not have to be around people who judge her. Jesus doesn't actually explain what he means when he says he brings a spring of gushing water to eternal life. Though she gets the sense, and we get the sense, that this spring of water fills something spiritual within us. Because their conversation moves on into the realm of worship and proper worship and where one can properly worship. Jesus tells her these boundaries are coming to an end because of him, because of what he's doing and will do. The divide between Jewish people and Samaritans won't matter because access to God is about to explode around the whole world. This woman does leave when the disciples return but she doesn't go back home and keep the conversation she had with Jesus a secret. She shares it with that same community that she's been trying to avoid that day by going to the well at noon. She tells her fellow citizens of Sakaar that the Messiah is at their well. And the people, the people believe her and go to see Jesus for themselves. This woman, this nameless woman, is the first apostle for our Lord and Savior. The disciples don't become apostles until after Christ's death and resurrection. But this woman, this Samaritan woman, can't keep quiet over the good news and the welcome 
she received from Jesus. She feels compelled to tell her community and her community believes her and then believes in Jesus after they speak with him. This interaction is world breaking in the fact that Jesus then willingly stays in the Samaritan city for two days. And I'm sure he's doing lots of teaching and preaching and healing to this group that it has been dismissed by their religious cousins. This community comes to believe in Jesus Christ as the Messiah because of this woman. And this past Wednesday, we celebrated International Women's Day. And so I truly believe it's so fitting that we're focusing on this amazing woman this week. She was unafraid, unafraid and unashamed to tell the story of how Jesus Christ impacted her and helped her to feel valued rather than judged for the circumstances of her life. And this is true for all of us because God is with us and gives us true peace because we're so loved by God. When we make mistakes or mess up, we know God's love for us won't change. And so we do our best to try and do better. We continue to make space for that spring of living water to continually nourish our relationship to God by the power of the Holy Spirit within us. And yet we're not always great at it. I know there are places in my life where I'm still thirsty. And I'm guessing you have places too. Places where God's gift of life and love hasn't fully encompassed. Places where you struggle or don't seem to make any progress, even though you want to so desperately. Like for me, I can let my frustration brew under the surface, right? And then when it's not needed or necessary, when I'm extra tired or hungry or sad, it just kind of explodes, right? And I don't think of myself as an angry person, but I can get unreasonably frustrated, angry, upset over the smallest thing that a loved one says or does when I've just had too many things pile up. And I know that as I transition into motherhood, and this will likely be an issue, as I live through the stress of having a child and not sleeping as much as my body would like or need. You too have places in your lives that feel like deserts, like water has never been there. So offer this part of your life to God. Pray that you'll be able to work through it with God's help. For Christ does offer us the spring of everlasting water. The reality is not only are we thirsty, but our world is thirsty. So where do you see the thirst for Christ's life-giving water? Where is the Holy Spirit prompting you to reach out and assist? Where do you feel the nudge for this church community to dig a well and offer the gift of needed water? Let us think, consider, and pray over where God is calling us to be Christ's disciples and apostles to share this life-giving water in a world that's so dry. Amen. Would you now please stand as you are able, in body or in spirit, to join in hymn number 356, Come Thou Fact of Every Blessing. <laughs>
Let us write, recite together our affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He descended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. May be seated. You get to be seated. I have to keep standing up. I don't think that's fair. <laughs> that's why I keep forgetting to say, go ahead and sit down, because I don't get to sit down. Uh, this is the moment in our service when we talk about our joys and about our concerns. And first of all, Phil? Yes, I have a concern. Uh, my aunt, Lois, Christ, and stuff, and I'm taking a stroke this weekend. She's currently in the hospital and asking prayers for Lois. Uh, God have mercy for our prayer. Uh, Chris? Um, yeah, we have two concerns. Um, first, a good friend of ours, um, mother passed away. Um, her name is uh, from cancer. Her name is Lorraine Dispensary. I know it's a hard name to pronounce. It's dispensary. Um, and the other concern I have is um, a very special cousin of mine passed away. Um, also from uh, his name is Michael Dean, and Michael Dean, and, um, we found out that his cancer was most likely caused from um, him being involved with the cleanup in 911. Very, uh, very sad. God have mercy. Mercy, hear our prayer. Yeah. Yeah, concern also a very good friend of mine. Uh, his brother is uh, recently admitted to uh, <coughs> the Howe Hospital in Worcester County, and they are just trying to figure out whether he has a mask or what this would be. Uh, his brother's name is Ron. Ron Cole. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Linda? Prayers for my uh, brother's stepdaughter, Zinnia, uh, who was hit by a motorcycle and has uh, sustained many injuries as well as traumatic brain injury. Please pray for complete healing for Zinnia. God have mercy. Yeah, um, I have a joy. Um, my brother Jeff passed away last year. He was Out of mercy here, I pray. Are there any others in the sanctuary? Me. Ah. Um, my father, uh, he has shingles. He's in a lot of pain. So prayers for my dad. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Uh, how about, is there anyone on Zoom? Thank you all.
just so that we all are on the same page, these are the prayer requests that were shared this morning. Uh, Phil asked us to pray for Lois, Lois, right? Because she is in noon hospital currently. She had a mini stroke. Um, and I do know they're going to do an MRI because I checked in with Diane today. Um, so she's in the hospital and they're hoping to get her back home very soon. But a mini, she had a mini stroke. So prayers for her. Uh, Chris asked for two different prayers. Um, one, the first one is that her good friend's mother, Lorraine Dispensary. I probably spelled it wrong, but I wrote it so I could say it right. Uh, who recently died from cancer. And so we want to pray for Lorraine and her family. And then also the second is that Chris's dear cousin died, Michael Dean. Uh, he also died of cancer, which is they think likely due to things he was exposed to when, as he helped clean up for 9-11. Is that correct? Yeah. So prayers for Chris's family and those who loved Michael as they mourn his loss. Um, Bob shared that Donna had an ultrasound this past week on her kidneys and they did find some kind of lump or mass on one of them. And so there's gonna be more follow-up testing. So definitely prayers for Donna. Um, and Bob this week as they continue through that testing. And then Chuck's friend's brother, is that correct? Yes. Okay, Chuck's friend's brother, Ron Culver, is in the hospital with some sort of mass and they're not sure exactly what it is, but they're doing tests about it. So prayers for those tests and what may come from that. Linda reminded us to pray for her brother's stepdaughter's her brother's stepdaughter, Xenia, because she's in the hospital after the accident with the motorcyclist. We prayed for her last week as well. We're going to continue praying for her um, about with her traumatic brain injury and all the other injuries that came from that, that accident that happened. Uh, Julie, my mom, asked for prayers of joy for the fact that her friend Peggy, a lifelong friend from childhood, was able to come and visit her this weekend to attend the baby shower that I threw and my mom threw yesterday. Um, and so grateful for that connection to continue to thrive these years later, um, as, well, as well as traveling for Peggy as she goes back to New Hampshire tonight or today. Charlie asked us to pray for our country. And then I requested that we pray for my father, Ken, uh, because he has shingles and is in a lot of pain. So with this in mind, let us turn our hearts to God in prayer together today. God of wisdom and insight, guide our thoughts and our actions to be more aligned with your wishes for the world. As we pray today, may our hearts be connected by the power of your Holy Spirit to you and to one another. Awe-inspiring God, we pray first for your church around the world for those who believe in you and in your power in this world. May we be united in our service in the name of Jesus Christ. Help us all to be your hands and feet in this thirsty and dry world. Trustworthy God, we now pray for our country and the many leaders. May they all set aside the pettiness that divides and instead work together to support the vision and ideals of our country's values and your values, oh God so that this country will be a guiding light in the world for peace, justice, and service. Everlasting God, your guidance and your gift of everlasting water is more than enough for us. And so as we pray for those closest to us, both the needs shared and the needs kept within our hearts, guide us to live into our baptisms and share your love and support to those we know need it. We pray especially for Lois, for the family and friends of Lorraine and Michael. We pray for Donna and the tests she will be having, as well as for Ron, who will also be having more tests. We pray that both of them may give some really sound advice to move forward. May they trust in you 
oh God. We also pray for Xenia as she continues to heal. May your healing hand be upon her, that her life and her livelihood may be restored. And God, we also thank you for the joys in our lives, including the joys of lifelong friends and them coming to visit, the joy of celebrating the coming of new life and seeing people come together to support this new life, whether it be on Zoom or in person, and the beauty of those coming together. Creator God, you made this world good, and so we pray for this world that you created. As we travel through this Lenten season, help us to seek your presence with all the people we interact with and see. May our eyes see the world as you see it, full of possibility and interconnected beauty. God, we thank you for the many ways we've been so abundantly blessed by you, including the gift of prayer, and especially the prayer Jesus taught his disciples, which we will now pray together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. One of the ways God helps us to grow is giving us opportunities to give to one another and to other people in need. Let us share with God's community in this church as a sign of our own thankfulness for the ways God has blessed us abundantly. Love. 
Use these gifts to bring us together as a community as we prepare to go out and serve the community around us. Show us how to be more generous in all we do. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. This is now the time in our service where we share announcements, ways we can serve a community or one another. Um, who would like to start this morning? Okay, I see multiple hands. We'll start with Nancy. Yes, uh, the will be meeting uh, after the service this morning. Uh, that will be the for a few minutes, and then we'll be in the sanctuary. Thank you, Nancy. The deacons are meeting after church here in the sanctuary. Go get a few nibbles, socialize for a few minutes, and then we'll have our meeting in the sanctuary. And then I saw Ashley's hand. I have two announcements. One is that um, the next week I'll have a box that will be in our effects if anyone would like to donate candy for our Easter egg hunt. Um, if you could get some small, like individual wrap type candies. It would be appreciated. And also, I'm looking for anyone who's interested in filling in to do the children's time message while Pastor Catherine is away. So if anyone is interested in filling in for a week, please see me. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Yes. Those of you who may be interested in filling in for the children's time while I'm away with this little one, that would be very helpful since it is an important part of our service. So please see Ashley to sign up for a week or two of that. And she Ashley also asked for donations for candy, individual small wrapped candy for the Easter egg hunt, which will take place on Easter Sunday after worship. And then I think I saw either Charlie or Penny. Charlie. Okay, I'm gonna give everyone a quiz this morning. Oh boy. And you know how you like quizzes. Everybody is gonna get an A minus. You ain't perfect. But if I asked you this morning what the one word that Pastor Catherine's sermon was all about, everybody would say water. I'm going to use water for what I'm going to say as a metaphor. If you take a look in the fellowship wall, you will see a bar graph. That bar graph consists of our per capita giving. We owe $5,100, of which we have just paid $2,550, half of it. So between now and December 31st, we are going to pay, I'm going to repeat that again, we are going to pay the rest of that. That means each of us owes $42.50. 84, $85 per family. So please help us stay together. It's not only for our church that we're giving, it is also for all of the other churches in Presbyter, excuse me, in Presbyter. So reach out, give, it's for them, it's for us as well. So water was used, that metaphor is giving, please give thank you thank you charlie and yours truly made the bulletin board so uh i think it's kind of cute if you have any questions about it i can explain and so can janet who helped me put it up so that when i'm not here in the next few months it can be explained to folks who are like what does this mean there's people who can understand it help understand how my brain works um, i also wanted to remind everybody to put your Easter flower orders in. If you'd like to make, I don't know, uh, just order Easter flowers. Can't think of the words I wanted. Um, fill this out, give it to Mike so that you can help beautify the chancel as we celebrate the great resurrection of our Lord and Savior. I think that's all that I really wanted to make sure we announced today. So with that in mind, let us Stand as we are able in body or spirit and join together in hymn number 554, Let All Things Now Living.
So friends, go out into the world sharing the news that Christ will give us everlasting water. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.